What really is life? Today, we're gonna to look at NASA's definition of life, these five things that break it, viruses, the microbiome, vent bacteria, and then also things like fire and cars. And by looking at those five different weird versions of life, we're gonna get new definitions of life that I think are closer to the truth. Let's dive in. Okay, what's up everybody? If you're new here, welcome. My name is Reese, and I was a tech ethics teacher at MIT for a while, but now I'm just an information sponge. You know, over the past decade or so, I've done hundreds of interviews and read hundreds of books, and I've put all of those ideas into a note card system. So I have 20,000 note cards, and so I have a little bit of a fluency in the language of reality, and I wanna share that fluency with you. And we're doing that through this How Everything Evolves series from the Big Bang through AI. And thus far in the series, we've gone from the Big Bang 14 billion years ago. Here's now, we've looked at space, we've created all the atoms in the world, the library of atoms, and now we're here at 14 billion years ago, and we're about to start life. We're about to start life. And so that really begs the question, what is life? And so before talking about how life began and how it evolved, we're gonna first answer the question, what the heck is life? Okay, so we're gonna start with NASA's definition of life. Okay, here is NASA's definition of life. Life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. That's a good definition. You have a self-sustaining system, so something that is able to perpetuate itself through time, and it's built of chemicals, so it's chemical reactions, you know, biochemistry happening, capable of Darwinian evolution. So that means there's some kind of selection of inherited variation. I like this definition. It's a good definition. Let's start to break it though. And so we're gonna start to break this definition with a virus. And so a virus is weird. A virus has its own DNA, but then that's combined with, it doesn't have its own mitochondria, it doesn't have its own energy system, and it doesn't have its own ribosome. So it can't use that energy to produce new copies of itself. Obviously the whole idea behind a virus is that it uses the energy from one of our cells or from a different cell in the ribosome, the 3D printer from a different cell in order to replicate its own DNA. And so I, I kind of get why something like a virus might not align with NASA's definition because it's not self-sustaining. What a virus makes me think of is, you know, something more like us, you know, one of our cells, we have our own DNA, and then that nucleus, it uses the mitochondria and the ribosome with the, the nucleus DNA. But in that way, it's like, I guess, it's a question of boundaries, right? You're saying, oh, the virus doesn't count because it's using its own DNA, it's using our mitochondria and ribosome, while we count because we have our own nucleus with its own DNA and with own mitochondria and ribosome. But mitochondria is funny because it, it has its own DNA. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just think this is a funny question of where you determine the boundary of the system. Viruses are essentially smart because tons of mitochondria and ribosomes already in the world. So they were like, I'm just gonna use those existing energy and 3D printing systems, and then I'm gonna use my own DNA to get, to find my way into a cell and then reproduce copies of myself. So it used kind of a background condition of existing mitochondria and ribosomes. So that's why virus doesn't count, but I think you could just as easily claim, in my opinion, that a nucleus is a little self-sustaining unit, that the mitochondria is its own self-sustaining unit with its own DNA, and then they use the ribosome to produce copies of itself. And so it depends on where you determine the self is. Another question for where you draw the self is the microbiome. The microbiome is very weird, right? Something like us, we count ourselves as a full self-sustaining unit, but actually we're about 70 trillion human cells and also 70 trillion bacteria cells in our microbiome. These two things combined, why does that count us as a self? You know, it's a weird thing when you have a new child, you're not just birthing a new child, you're providing them with a whole microbiome. You give them a microbiome, like a kind of like a little yogurt, and then 10% of mom's milk actually goes towards feeding the bacteria in the microbiome. This makes me just think, okay, where am I drawing the boundary again? You know, we couldn't live without our microbiome at all. <laughs> and the microbiome couldn't live without us. And so we are a hollow biont, is the term for that. That is a combination of our own cells and the bacteria cells. So again, we're kind of self-sustaining, but we are only self-sustaining with our microbiome. And then obviously in a macro sense, we're only self-sustaining with the fungi and the plants that exist in the whole world around us. Now for a second, I wanna talk about vent bacteria. Vent bacteria are these extremophiles. And these extremophiles were a very strange thing for us to find. We only found them in the 1980s, 1990s. Up until that point, we thought that everything lived above the surface, obviously, and that nothing lived deep in the ocean. 
But since then, we've learned that roughly 90% of bacteria actually live in the subsurface, and then some of them live at these deep ocean vents. And it's funny that we call them extremophiles because that's actually maybe where life started, is that we're actually on land, we're the extreme ones, and we just saw these strange creatures as strange and, and living in an extreme environment just because they're different than us, but they're actually the original version of life. And these extremophiles, they tell us a lot about what life is like down there. You can see they are methanogens, which means that they produce methane as a byproduct, and they live in these symbiotic bacterial mat ecosystems, and they eat rocks, you know, they eat hydrogen sulfide. And so instead of using, instead of photosynthesizing, they instead use the H2S and they use rip hydrogen off of that. And then they'll sometimes eat the rocks. Instead of using carbon from the atmosphere, they'll use carbon that exists down there from CO2 or whatever, and then use that to build their bodies. And so if you looked at the DNA of an extremophile, you'd see all these weird things for how it metabolizes and breathes and eats rocks. And that would tell you about its environment and vice versa. If you looked at an environment, you could be like, whoa, what lives here? And so extremophiles, I love to use them as a second definition of life. So extremophiles tell us that life is a mirror of its niche, that DNA is essentially just another way to talk about the environment. If you were a strange organ, if you were an alien coming to view earth and you looked at birds, you'd say, wow, they're very light. They're flying around ah, there's probably an atmosphere here. There's probably an environment and what that looks like. Or if you looked at the environment, you said, oh, wow, there's a lot of air. There are these jet streams. Maybe they're gonna be these birds that use it to go from the North Pole to the South Pole. And so we can always kind of tell that life is essentially just the reverse of its niche. So you can use this to do ancestral DNA uh, reproduction where you use the DNA to c construct, reconstruct an ancestral environment, which I think is very cool. Okay, so that's life is the mirror of the niche. And now we can talk about something like fire. And I think that's an interesting question. You know, when we look at this, you know, life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Fire is definitely a self-sustaining chemical system. It burns and then it burns until it runs out of its energy and its environment. Is it capable of Darwinian evolution though? That's arguable. And I think that gets to a difficult question about the difference between the genotype and the phenotype. For something like a fire, the genotype is the phenotype where its structure is equal to the pattern. Well, for something like us, we have a genotype in here that then produces its phenotype, and then all that gets passed down is the, the genes, the genotype. While for other things, like physical structures, the information that's passed down is simply the structure itself, where the genotype equals the phenotype. And so something like fire, I do think arguably it could, it is capable of Darwinian evolution. There is a replication through time of fire, where it's, hey, I'm a fire, I'm gonna go burn some buildings, I'm gonna go burn some wood, and then over time, it kind of shifts its form to access the energy around it, is kind of of replicating itself into new niches over time, though I get why one would say that it is not capable of variation. You know, there's the variation only, it's not able to find new answers to new problems. It only has a certain range that it can operate in. And I'd also understand someone that says that inheritance doesn't really exist here, that you're not inheriting a genotype, but rather you're inheriting just the same pattern over time. You're inheriting a, a fire phenotype over time. But there are things like fire species and all that. So, but I think what fire also can tell us is there's this great line that, that life is controlled burning. In other words, when we as life, and that for us, what we do is we have oxygen, you know, inside of us, and then we take carbon or glucose, those, those sugars, and we take the hydrogen off that and we bring it towards oxygen and then use, you know, that energy from that process to push protons above the mitochondria and then use that to then pull them back through ATP synthase, creating ATP, which then the rest of our body uses. And so we're using the same process of oxidizing hydrogen and we're just using it in a very controlled way where we're burning it but as and we're outputting co2 but as we're burning it we're bringing it through a very specific molecular process that stores up the electrons over time and stores up the energy over time and then eventually transfers that to atp that the rest of our body can use and so fire is just straight burning arguably not a system capable of Darwinian evolution, but life has controlled burning and is capable of Darwinian evolution. Okay, and the final idea here is that of a car. 
Does a car count as life? I think this is again a complicated question. You know, we know that the biological world counts as life. Some of the physical world probably doesn't, like fires and mineral evolution and all of that. Stuff like cars and technology and computer viruses, they look like life in many ways. You know, a car is in some ways a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. A car you put in the the fire, the fire burns, you, you light on fire, it burns the motor, the motor goes around and it gets access to more energy by being useful to us, it's symbiotic creatures in its environment, and then we fill it up with more gas and it keeps on running. So again, this brings up the concept of what does self mean here, the nature of the self? And you know, a car is weird because it doesn't look like it can self-sustain, but once you add the car plus the human, then it very clearly is a self-sustaining system where the world now has you know, almost 10 billion people and almost a billion cars. And so the human plus car thing is almost certainly a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. And that gets to a very strange concept about technology and how technology is different than life. Life solves problems primarily inside of itself. If I'm a gazelle and I wanna run faster, I will get longer legs or more muscles or something like that. They're all controlled by the genotype changing my phenotype, changing my physical body. Very occasionally, they'll externalize things like, oh, I'll be a beaver and I'll do some niche construction, and create a dam, or I'm a human and I'm built in a world of the microbiome and you know microbiology, and so I need to just use that existing microbiological substrate and I'll get built on top of that. So life almost always evolves with an internal system. However, humans and technology and culture, we usually evolve by externalizing with, we used to have hair on our bodies, but we externalize that into clothes. And now we have, we've kind of outsourced it and delegated it. We used to have longer guts so that when we ate raw meat, we could actually consume it better. We used to have bigger teeth but now we have knives, which are kind of like external teeth, and we have fire, which is like an external stomach. We used to run around everywhere, but now we have cars. We've externalized you know, motion into that. Or we used to use our brains more, but we've externalized that into computers and into AI. And so that's a fundamental difference between how technology and humans solve problems by externalizing them and then using our hands primarily as a mechanism to interact with that world versus life, which solves those problems internally to some body system primarily. The other strange thing about a car is that cars are helpful, not because of the specific atoms, but because of the way that those atoms are, re are arranged. So this is a Cesar Hidalgo piece on why information grows, that book of his. And he thinks about a Lamborghini, it's worth $200,000 in its beautiful form, but if you take that Lamborghini and you crash it, it's worth roughly $0. And so this tells us that the valuable things are contained in the information, not the material. And we can also use this to, and apply this with Lee Cronin's and Sarah Walker's uh, assembly theory, which states that any object's complexity is determined by how many chops it would take to create that object. And so something simple, like a little small molecule, it only has a couple bonds, and so maybe has an assembly index of 10, while something like a car, oh my God, in order to create that, it has an assembly index of you know, a million. You have to be, do all these specific things to make it this amazing car. And if you crash that car and lose all of that informational structure, then you lose the value in that thing. And so in, in assembly theory, you can look at the world and look for complicated things that have a high assembly index that take lots of like this watch, a Sharpie, and those things take lots of information in order to create. And then you could look at things with high assembly index and also a high copy index, where you have lots of copies of those in the world. I don't just have one Sharpie at my home, I have dozens, you know, and there are billions of cars in the world. And so traditionally speaking, before life, you only got things with a low assembly index and then high copy index. So you got lots of rocks, you got lots of suns or stars or planets, and so those have are not that complicated to make, but you get lots of them. Once we got life, you can get things with a high assembly index, very complicated cats or what have you, and then that also have a high copy index. There's lots and lots of them in the world. And But technology also creates things with a high assembly index and a high copy index. And so that is things like cars and microphones and cell phones and things like that. And so we can use this to say another thing that life is, which is something with a high copy index 
and a high assembly index. Though we also know that technology creates those things too. Okay, so I hope this helps expand your idea of what life might be, that it's definitely a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution, classic definition, very nice, that pushes us all to ask what are the boundary conditions of that self-sustainingness. <laughs> And we looked at how viruses in the microbiome really push the idea of where the boundary lies. We also looked at how life is the mirror of the niche, that you can look at any life form and you can determine with something like an extremophile or a bird, we can look at the genes to determine what environment, what ancestral environment that creature grew up in. And so the life is just another way to talk about the niche. And then we also looked at how life is controlled burning. You know, for something like a fire, it is a self-sustaining chemical system, arguable whether it has Darwinian evolution, and life takes those same fire processes of a self-sustaining chemical system and then does it in a more controlled way. And then finally, we looked at something like a car and how a car is produced as humans do by externalizing our solutions in the environment instead of life which internalizes the solutions and that life and technology are things with a high copy index and a high assembly index. So I hope today gives you a good idea for what life really is and then in the future episodes we're going to talk about the actual origin of life and how it formed. Thank you as always for watching and thank you to Roots Donors for supporting this channel. If you want to understand more about the past and how we got here, check out the previous videos here. And if you want to understand the future and where we're going, feel free to subscribe here. Hope to see you then. Bye.